Welcome everyone and thank you for joining Myotonic's 10th in a series of Friday afternoon webinars. The Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, known as Myotonic, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2007 by families with DM seeking support and a cure. Our mission, what we call care and a cure, is to enhance the quality of life of people living with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research focused on finding treatments and a cure. Our work focuses on support and education, research, and advocacy. A reminder of some of the resources and support opportunities that are available. All of our toolkits, publications, guidelines, um, some of which have just recently been released, are available on our toolkits and publications page. We've added many new virtual support group and Facebook chat opportunities. Our calendar of activities will also highlight both the support groups and the Facebook chats, as well as other events that are happening. And our Digital Academy, as always, hosts our presentations and videos from past conferences, events, and any of the past Friday afternoon webinar series as well. And a quick shout out for our fabulous new resources that are available. I think even as early as this morning, our nutrition guide for people living with myotonic dystrophy is now available on the website. And possibly as early as this weekend or early next week, we will see an exercise guide for individuals living with myotonic dystrophy, as well as an update to the role of physical therapy in the assessment and management of individuals living with myotonic dystrophy. A brief reminder about our family registry. You can increase your understanding of myotonic dystrophy and improve the lives of those living with DM by joining the myotonic dystrophy family registry. The registry helps researchers find new effective treatments and identify possible participants for upcoming clinical trials and research studies. It allows anyone who is registered to have access to the anonymous data, including individuals and families living with DM. The registry seeks to give all DM stakeholders, from researchers and pharmaceutical partners to family members, a better understanding of the disease, the DM community, and the current research and advocacy efforts underway. We have one session left in our virtual chair yoga series every Monday at 12 o'clock Pacific for the entire month of June. The amazing Ellen Shapiro has been offering yoga to the community. This coming Monday, June 22nd at 12 o'clock is her last session. You can see information on how to join via Zoom, or if you just want to call in by phone, you are welcome to do that too. A reminder that our mid-year survey has been distributed. We have just this, past, just this upcoming weekend left to participate. It's your last chance if you haven't already completed the survey. We want to know about your opinions, your interest for future webinars, conference topics, and the Myotonic brand. So the survey will close this Sunday at midnight. Please be sure to participate so we know what you're thinking. A reminder of the Friday afternoon webinar series. This is our final in this series. My Talk Dystrophy in the Brain is today, but all of our past webinars are available. You can go to the Friday afternoon webinar series page on our website. You can access all of the previous webinars. They are also hosted on the Digital Academy. So what you are all here for today, the webinar on myotonic dystrophy and the brain, causes, effects, and treatment. Our fabulous speakers today from Stanford University are Dr. J, Drs. Day, Dr. Jacinda Sampson, Gail Deutsch, and Dr. Kamali. If you would like to ask questions of any of the speakers, please just type the questions into the chat box of GoToWebinar. And with time permitting, we will ask the speakers to address them at the end of their presentation. If we are unable to get to those questions, we will certainly forward them via email. And if they are able to, the presenters will respond via email as well. So 
Our first speaker will be Dr. John Day. He is a professor of neurology, pediatrics, and pathology at Stanford University, where he's the director of the Division of Neuromuscular Medicine. He has more than 30 years of experience diagnosing and caring for patients of all ages with myotonic dystrophy. He has spearheaded efforts to define central nervous system effects of DM, focusing on sleep abnormalities for clinically significant, therapeutically tractable, and objectively quantifiable CNS features in DM. Dr. Day proudly serves on Myotonic's Board of Directors and our Scientific Advisory Committee. Dr. Sampson is a clinical associate professor at Stanford University Hospitals and Clinics. She is a neuromuscular and neurogenetics specialist who has been caring for patients and families with myotonic dystrophy and other familiar neurological disorders for over 12 years. She is actively involved in observational and clinical research in myotonic dystrophy and other neuromuscular and neurogenetic disorders. Dr. Deutsch is a clinical professor in the Department of Neurology and Neurological Sciences at Stanford University. She's the lead neuropsychologist at the Stanford Comprehensive Epilepsy Center and the Stanford Center for Memory Disorders. She received her doctoral degree in clinical psychology at Drexel University and completed a pre-doctoral internship at the Brain Behavior Laboratory Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. And last but definitely not least, Dr. Kamali is a postdoctoral fellow who joined Stanford University in September of 2019. Her research interests primarily lie in the design of new machine learning techniques for healthcare and developing clinical decision support systems to achieve accurate and robust prediction, particularly in cases of having partially labeled training data. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Day. Excellent. Thanks so much, Tanya. It's great to be here. Thank you for uh, coming, uh, all of you. And it's uh, obviously an important topic that we're excited to at least start discussing. I think uh, we can all be aware that this is a very complex field, and so we're only going to touch on it. Uh, Tanya did a great job of introducing everybody, so I won't go into it in detail other than to make the obvious point that this is very much a team effort so that we approach this as a team to try to understand the different aspects of myotonic dystrophy. So I'm going to start out just talking about the underlying mechanisms of myotonic dystrophy and then uh, Jacinda will talk about the clinical manifestations of those. Gail will get into the neuropsychological features and how we can quantify those and then we don't know what we don't know and so it became obvious to us that we needed to start a new approach to understanding uh, this aspect of myotonic dystrophy. And so we are very excited, uh, not quite a year ago, to introduce uh, Dr. Kamali uh, to our team as a postdoc supported by important members of the myotonic dystrophy community so she could use machine learning or artificial intelligence to hopefully give us a new view of what's going on. So that's what the overall scheme is today. So to just think about the CNS involvement of myotonic dystrophy, there are a number of things that come up in addition to the changes in sleep that we'll spend a lot of time talking about today, but people will describe these in different ways. And like everything in myotonic dystrophy, it's highly variable. So some patients have very few of these symptoms, some have much more significant symptoms, but these are common uh, that occur at various times during the course of myotonic dystrophy, more of almost a mental fatigue, obviously the daytime sleepiness, some uh, forgetfulness or confusion, or people will describe it as kind of a brain fog, uh, difficulty organizing or coordinating thoughts. Those are more common. This isn't the cause of something like Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't cause dementia in that way. And importantly, as I'll indicate in just a few slides, it doesn't cause degeneration or loss of nerve cells. This gives us some optimism that some of the features of the central nervous system effects of myotonic dystrophy, much as we believe is true in the muscle and the heart and the gut 
uh, that a lot of these features might very well be responsive to treatment. But of course, we're not going to really know that until we get into it. So just to remind everybody, where does what is myotonic dystrophy? I think most people are comfortable with the fact that myotonic dystrophy type 1 is due to this expansion of this repeat, so a CTG expansion in this one gene. And myotonic dystrophy type 2 is similarly due to an expansion, this time of a CCTG repeat. So that's the commonality at the genetics level. And what that does is that it causes this clumping of RNA. So as you may remember from biology, the genes are, are carried in DNA in the chromosomes. They're expressed as RNA, and then those RNA strands are read or interpreted into uh, to creating protein. But in myotonic dystrophy, it's the RNA that tends to clump up in the nuclei of these cells. Now, these cells here are nuclei of muscle cells, but it's also true in the brain. So this is work from now several years ago out of Charles Thornton's lab showing, and here are these same clumps. So these are same clumps in the brain cells in this instance of myotonic dystrophy type one and type two. And as expected, they do not occur in control brain uh, nerve cells but they occur quite ubiquitously in the nerve cells of DM1 and DM2. This is a misprint, this should say. Uh, I guess this one is DM, they're, both of these are DM1. I didn't put up the slide of the DM2, uh, but they occur in both, uh, both DM1 and DM2. And here you can see the clumps in the nuclei and what they tend to do, and we're not gonna have time to get into this in detail, is they sequester, they attract and hold on to these special proteins that uh, bind to the RNA so that you're getting a loss of the function of these proteins. We don't need to go into that, but that's the one of the primary mechanisms of the disorder is the sequestration in these clumps of these special RNA binding proteins. So really glossing over this, the good news is that there's very little effect on the brain so that the brain actually is structurally quite normal. We do see some changes. We get increase in space around a lot of the blood vessels that we think maybe is kind of a downstream consequence of the fact that the nerve cells, even though they're present and they're not being destroyed, aren't functioning quite typically. And so you get some of these changes maybe from extracellular fluid in the brain. But nonetheless, uh, the nerve cells are intact. And here again is a picture of the nerve cells primarily being intact and in the right place. We do see some minor changes, but it's hard to associate the minor changes that we see at the microscopic level with the functional changes that we see clinically that I kind of described at the outset. So the only really minor changes in this is true in both DM1 and DM2. We are further evaluating this. There are other things we're doing. But what we do see on the MRI scan is we see some changes. So we see these white signals showing up on the MRI scans of brains. Again, both DM1 and DM2 have these white signals. We think this might relate to what I was showing you around the the perivascular spaces or around the, the vessels, there's this increased presence of fluid. It might not be itself all that worrisome. It's not necessarily a sign of a lot of damage. It might just, again, be a sign of some dysfunction, uh, but it might underlie or at least reflect uh, the changes in function that we see in myotonic dystrophy. And then if we continue to look uh, at uh, the MRI scans, we can look at them in a functional way. So we're looking at these signals so that we can see whether or not this part of the brain is coordinated or talking to this part of the brain quite right. And without going into detail, what this is showing us is that it's not quite right. There's a disconnection of these different areas. And I'm just showing you one example. There are multiple examples where there's a, an incoordination or lack of coordination 
in the in the uh, communication of one area to the next. So again, we think that that might be reflected in those white matter signals that I was showing, the extra fluid in there. So I don't want to get into the weeds on this. I very much am just trying to give you an overall view. Our sense is that the genetic change that we see leads to some internal changes in how the cells work, but doesn't necessarily damage or permanently, permanently damage or destroy those cells. And that leads to this uh, poor communication that may underlie the kinds of psychological changes that we're seeing. So that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to put this in context so that now we can hear from the other speakers who can lead to a, a further understanding of what we're trying to deal with when we get into the treatment era. So there are the little dots. Those are the RNA accumulations in the, in the nerve cells of everybody. And we think it leads to this miscommunication between areas. And that is the underlying biology that we think is responsible for the neuropsychological challenges that some people with myotonic dystrophy experience. So why don't I stop at this point and see if we can switch over. I didn't even have a chance to click it before Leah got it and hopefully we'll get Jacinda going. So thank you. Okay, so thanks for inviting us to talk about the brain and myotonic dystrophy. And uh, I think one of the interesting functions of the brain is sleep. Um, sleep is more than just turning your brain off for a period of time. It's actually a pretty complex function. Um, and sleep is a common problem in myotonic dystrophy. Um, we have a fair amount of data both here at Stanford and at other institutions that um, the majority of people experience some degree of daytime sleepiness. And it may be severe enough to be classified as what we call idiopathic hypersomnolence, which is a tendency to fall asleep during the day when you wouldn't want to. And many individuals have an increased requirement for sleep. Everyone talks about getting the quote unquote normal eight hours of sleep, but that might not be enough if you have myotonic dystrophy. And the sleep itself is different, um, that you can see that there's sleep apnea and there can be more than one type. Um, the sleep apnea can be the more typical type that you see in the general population, which is obstructive sleep apnea, but it also can originate in the brain itself, as well as mixed forms. There's differences in the depth of sleep and the duration of the different sleep stages that sleep isn't, again, isn't just an on off switch to your brain. Your brain is actually doing a lot when it's asleep. Uh, in myotonic dystrophy, many people have fragmented sleep meaning that they aren't sleeping well and they aren't getting good deep sleep and that they're frequently awakening um, and even if they don't realize it. And that means that their sleep is fragmented and that they have poor sleep efficiency, um, basically meaning when you wake up in the morning, you still feel tired. Um, and uh, some individuals um, have a lot of uh, muscle movements in their sleep, which are called periodic limb movements of sleep which means that you might tend to kick or thrash or throw your covers off. And this is more often in myotonic dystrophy type two than in type one. But again, it's something that can disrupt your sleep as well as that of your bed partner. So when we asked our patients about their sleep problems, uh, we found that there's a lot of different aspects of sleep that are, are disrupted in myotonic dystrophy. But you'll also notice in the general population that there's a fair amount of, of, of sleep disorders as well. So blue is individuals without myotonic dystrophy, and red is everybody with myotonic dystrophy, both type 1 and 2. So you can see that very few people reported that they didn't have a sleep problem. But there was also a pretty large number of people who don't have myotonic dystrophy who also have sleep problems. But the type of sleep problems vary. So as I just described, daytime sleepiness is, is, is very common. Not feeling rested when you wake up in the morning is also very common. But so is insomnia and frequent awakenings during sleep. And even your sleep schedule can be disrupted. And I'll talk a little bit more about how your brain keeps on a schedule uh, in a minute or two. But there can be other things. 
restless legs is um, that movement of, of your muscles or feeling an urge to kick or wiggle your legs that can happen at night, can even feel like creepy crawly feelings in your legs. And that can be more common in myotonic dystrophy type two than in type one. And cataplexy is a phenomenon where you feel uh, uh, weakness with sudden emotion. And that's something that's typical of narcolepsy. And many people compare the sleepiness in myotonic dystrophy to the sleepiness in narcolepsy, but there are some important differences there. So like I said, sleep isn't just an on off switch. Um, there's different sleep stages from zero, uh, basically being um, uh, lying in bed, one being drowsiness to four being really deeply asleep. And REM sleep, REM stands for rapid eye movements. And that means that when you're asleep, your eyes tend to roll and move around. Um, and that is the dreaming sleep, that everybody needs some degree of dreaming sleep during uh, the night. Even if you don't remember your dreams, it is an important part of the sleep stage to keep your brain healthy and it's part of your normal brain function. And you can see that that um, all of these different stages come and go over the course of the night. And you can observe a lot of this on a sleep study, which looks not only at your brain waves, it looks at your muscle activity, your breathing, the movement of your chest wall as you breathe, as well as your abdomen, what is your oxygen doing, and what is your heart rate doing. So we get a ton of information from a classical sleep study. So one of the most um, basic things that happen when we're asleep is that a lot of our bodily functions go on autopilot. Um, you don't want to think about breathing, and, and you probably don't. Um, and that your normal breathing has a rhythm, and that rhythm is controlled in your brain. And it is responding to different signals in your blood and in your body um, to know how fast you should breathe and how deeply you should breathe. And if you have what's called central sleep apnea, and apnea means pausing or slowing of your breathing when you're asleep, you'll see that there's this kind of waxing and waning of your breathing. So you, there might be a pause, and then your breathing is slow, and then it picks up speed, and then it slows down again. And that is basically an indicator that the regulation of your sleep control in your brain is waxing and waning as well uh, because your your need to breathe deeply when you're asleep there isn't as much metabolic demand when you're unconscious uh, but there still is an important need to get rid of carbon dioxide which is the waste product of your body and bring in oxygen which is the fuel for your body to run uh, while you're asleep obstructive sleep apnea is a little bit different where the muscles and your tongue are blocking your airways and impeding the, the, the movement of air, which can cause an awakening. So you wake up and then you breathe more deeply while you're in that awakening, which you might not remember until everything in your loop normalizes and then you drift off to sleep again. So happily, you don't have to think about breathing in order to breathe. But it is a brain function, and it is all part of your brain stem. And there are different segments that communicate with each other to speed up your breathing or slow down your breathing, depending on how it senses the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in your blood. And some of this is also affected by another function of sleep, which is its control on your muscle tone. So you all probably think, you know, when you sleep, your muscles relax, which is very true. Um, but it's actually a brain function of the relaxation and sleep. And part of that is so that when you're in REM sleep or dreaming sleep, that your body remains still um, and you aren't enacting your dreams. Some people do enact their dreams, which is abnormal uh, and not a great function. So you don't want to find yourself talking or walking in your sleep, which, which can happen in some people. Um, but one of the important things that we know about uh, muscle tone in sleep is that uh, it also regulates the muscle tone in your breathing. And so all those muscles in the back of your throat, like your palate and your pharynx um, uh, and the muscles of your respiratory uh, function, your chest wall and your diaphragm 
are all regulated in your sleep as well. And if they relax like this cat does, they tend to get floppy and they can block your airflow. And that's what obstructive sleep apnea is. And then if your chest wall has muscle weakness or your diaphragm has weakness, then there's less power to move the air as well. And so you might uh, not snore loudly, uh, uh, but there may be um, obstruction of your breathing. Um, another part of how your brain controls your sleep is knowing when you should sleep. And this is your internal clock. And this is called the circadian rhythm. It is not only a function of your brain, it is throughout your body. In every cell, there's a metabolic link to an internal clock that is genetically regulated. Um, in your brain, uh, the perception of light, sunlight or blue light, um, enters through your eyes and it stimulates your pineal gland to secrete hormones such as uh, melatonin and other uh, signaling molecules to tell your brain when it's daytime and when it's nighttime, when should it be awake and when should it be asleep. And all of these things are genetically regulated. So your body has an internal clock. And there is some data that uh, case reports that the, the internal clock may not be terribly accurate in the myotonic dystrophies. So it may be that your clock needs constant reminders for when it needs to be set. Your brain also is a function not only of its structure and all these networks that Dr. Day described on the neuroimaging, it's also a function of all of the neurotransmitters that those connections use to communicate with each other. So this soup of neurotransmitters can either have activating properties or sedating properties. And so a lot of common medications can have effects on your central nervous system, um, including uh, benzodiazepines such as Valium or Ativan can cause people to be more sleepy and also to make your uh, respiratory drive relax sometimes too much so that you have more apnea. Antihistamines, which are great for allergies, also can make you feel sleepy as well. Um, there are other medications that can help with alertness, some of which are prescribed by physicians to help with the sleepiness and myotonic dystrophy, and also some antidepressants can help as well. And then there are some favorite over-the-counter uh, uh, remedies for sleepiness. Caffeine is uh, one uh, common recreational drug uh, in our coffee, in our tea, in our sodas that help um, at least temporarily improve alertness. And then melatonin, which is a natural hormone in our brain, is also available as an over-the-counter supplement that some doctors recommend to help regulate your brain circadian rhythm uh, so your brain knows when it should be awake and when it's okay to go to sleep. So sleep is a really interesting and important function of our brain. If we don't get good sleep, our brain does not function well. Um, it is regulated by an internal clock, which is our circadian rhythm. Uh, we can find in the spinal fluid abnormalities uh, in uh, levels of certain uh, signaling hormones and uh, uh, molecules that help regulate uh, alertness. Uh, one is called um, hypocretin, uh, can be changed in myotonic dystrophy. Your muscle tone is related and regulated by sleep, and that can cause obstructive sleep apnea. Um, your breathing is regulated by your brainstem and sleep, and that is a brain function. All of this affects the ups and downs of sleep, of how deeply you sleep and how well you sleep. And the end product of that um, is an effect on how alert you are the next day and how fatigued you are. So I think if we can understand how our brains sleep in myotonic dystrophy, we could go a long way to understanding how to feel better when we're awake in myotonic dystrophy. Um, I'm going to now pass it on to um, Dr. Deutsch to tell us a little bit more about how the brain works with um, cognition and other brain functions. Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this presentation. So it's really nice to be able to um, work with the team here at Stanford and to present this information and now I'm going to focus on the cognitive aspects of myotonic dystrophy or differences in cognition that we see with uh, myotonic dystrophy. And as Dr. Day pointed out, that this is a disorder 
where it can be different, can show up differently um, across DM1 and DM2, but it can also be different in each person that has even DM1. So basically what we do know is that in the congenital form, you're more likely to see a higher degree of cognitive impairment. Um, when there is a child that has um, DM1, one of the first signs could be cognitive problems. In DM1 in adults, we do know that um, cognitive abilities can um, really range from people that are affected from 24% to 75%. And this is the group that we have the most data on. And DM2, there is less likely to be impairment, and we know at least one third may not have any cognitive impairments. But the point is, even though we have these rules of thumb to go by, I know in different families with siblings that I could see two or three siblings that would have um, possibly no cognitive impairment to a much greater degree. So um, it's really hard to know how much cognitive impairment is going to be present in each individual unless that person is tested. Okay, so one area that we know is very affected in many people that have DM1 is problems with visual spatial abilities. And this means, can you really perceive objects and understand the relationships to each other? And how does this affect us in everyday life? So I'm going to show you a picture. Now, this is something that can be difficult for many people, but what you notice here, these are directions on how to make furniture. So you do not see anything verbal here in terms of how to put this piece of furniture together. Everything is done either with a picture, a diagram, a shape, and you have to be able to rotate these figures mentally in order to be put this furniture together. This is something that is sort of the classic issue in terms of a visual spatial problem. These are some of the tests that we give in order to assess this. So we ask people to um, rotate blocks mentally to see if the shapes are the same or different. We also can do this in a two-dimensional way, looking again to see if um, the same number of blocks are present or then they are they in the same position. This also translates into things at home like um, not only putting furniture together, but looking at cars, doing crafts, doing puzzles. These are all things that can break down somewhat in people that have DM1. Another area is processing speed. So it may not just be a reaction time. So how fast can you do a computer test or how fast can you respond to some kind of signal? But what we do see is when we time individuals to see how fast they complete a test or how they do in terms of if you're a child in school and you have to do academic tests such as math or reading and they're timed, it may actually take longer to complete the test. This is a measure of how mentally efficient someone is. And it also may be related to what Dr. Sampson was saying in terms of fatigue, because we know that many individuals, adults with um, DM1 may have excessive daytime sleepiness or fatigue, and this can definitely have a, an effect on how fast they're processing information. This area of executive functioning gets talked about a lot in individuals with DM1, and it ranges from executive functioning can be just purely just paying attention, but then can move into something like multitasking, being able to control your um, emotions, being able to um, sustain your effort, being able to focus. So it is a broad range in terms of an I, of a concept. And all these things are being usually thought to be controlled by the frontal systems of the brain. And these are things that can also break down 
in terms of DM1. So you may be able to do a task, but then let's say you have to switch to another task and then come back to the original task. This can be very hard to do. Another thing would be, let's say you had to organize a project. You may know all the pieces of the project, but being able to do them in sequence could be difficult or to see all the aspects of that and put it together. Another area is just being able to sustain your focus over time. So these are all things that relate to executive functioning. Um, I'm just gonna go into a little bit more detail so you can see this individual is trying to juggle lots of things, keep all these balls in the air. This is a really good way to think about multitasking, keeping track of two or more things at the same time. Um, something that we refer to as working memory. And this can be affected in day-to-day -day life in a few ways. So we think of working memory as just the ability to remember or hold on to maybe seven digits. So, you know, a long time ago when we had regular phones, we would hear a, dig a seven-digit number and be able to dial that number. But as soon as you dial the number, you probably don't remember it unless you constantly keep rehearsing it. That's an example of a very short-term working memory capacity. Ex another example would be, let's say you're at a restaurant and you're trying to figure out the tip. Um, if you're trying to do that in your head, you have to be able to remember what the price of the meal is, be able to know what percentage tip you wanna leave and hold all that information and do all that simultaneously. Working memory is also really important if you want to complete multi-step tasks because you have to know where you are in the task in order to finish it. You have to know what all the steps are and keep those in mind in order to complete a task. A lot of times I hear from my patients that doing these types of um, types of skills in their everyday life can be very difficult for them. And again, this has implications for children when they're in school for academics, as well as for adults, even doing household um, tasks also when they're working. Another area of executive functioning refers to apathy. So apathy means that you lack motivation. It's hard to get started. You don't seem as interested. You're not as willing to do social um, kinds of interactions. You may appear that you're uncaring or you're not responding emotionally. Um, it's hard for people to judge this in themselves. So a lot of times we do ask that caregivers or parents or people that know someone to try to give us a sense of this by answering questionnaires. And this is an area that still needs a lot of research. A lot of times apathy may be related to depression, but we do know in myotonic dystrophy, a person may not be depressed, but still show apathy. And then again, this can get in the way of doing your everyday kinds of tasks, doing schoolwork, and even at work. If you're apathetic, it's hard to be, mo to be motivated and to finish projects. So what can we do about these things? Um, some strategies, and we know this can help with apathy, is to try to keep an organized schedule and try to make lists, try to um, be able to prioritize what needs to be done, check off items, all these things people can do at home but sometimes it also really helps to be in contact with speech therapists, not that you need help with speech, but you may need help in terms of learning strategies. So things you can do on your own at home are these types of things, but it also helps to talk to someone professionally that really gets an understanding of where you're having difficulty, and then they can really try to apply these strategies and workarounds that really maybe meet your needs instead of just some general types of things. Um, Dr. Sampson also mentioned that some medications may help fatigue, that may in turn help a little bit in terms of 
these strategies and implementing them and, and not being as apathetic. So at school, um, if someone has a neuropsychological evaluation or something called an individualized education program, we do a lot of times ask for accommodations. So these are things like having extra time to complete tasks. There's different kinds of technology. Um, we're fortunate now that people have cell phones and have ways to set reminders for themselves. Um, we also ask teachers and school staff to um, even help children make checklists and have the child check in with the teacher at the beginning of the day and the next day in terms of are these assignments completed. Um, at work, it's really important to stay organized as much as possible, again, to prioritize tasks um, and use technology. And I'm just giving you a lot of um, general things, but a lot of times it does help to work with someone, either a therapist or like I said, a speech therapist that really has training working with people either with brain injuries or some type of cognitive impairment in order to be able to implement these kinds of strategies. So I wanted to leave with um, there's still so much that we need to do in terms of research. Three main areas are the visual spatial skills, processing speed, executive functioning, Neuropsychological evaluations, evaluations can really help to pinpoint an individual's strengths and weaknesses because, as I said before, not everyone has all these impairments or impairments can be mild or more severe. And there is not a cure in terms of a medication that is going to improve all these things, but different individualized interventions can be helpful. So I just wanted to thank my group and the myotonic group and then just turn this over to Dr. Camilla. Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is um, Tahira Kamali. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in Stanford. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here and um, share with you what we have found about um, the effects of myotonic dystrophy on brain using artificial intelligence. So what is artificial intelligence exactly, also known as AI? Before answering this question, let's talk about what natural intelligence is. If I ask you what you see here, you would say, this is a cat. Now, if I ask you which one is a cat and which one is a dog, you could easily discriminate a cat versus a dog. You would do that uh, because you have seen a lot of examples of cats and dogs in your life and have built a logic over your head to recognize what a dog or a cat is and what a dog or a cat isn't. Now let's go back to the original question. What is artificial intelligence? We have input training data. So every new cat that you see in real life or pictures and movies create a set of training data. This training data goes through computation in your mind, and then you create a model in your mind based on this input training data. And when you are shown a picture of a cat that you have never seen before, you can easily recognize that it's a cat. This new picture of a cat will be added to your input training data and will improve your model as you go along through your life. This mechanism is exactly how artificial intelligence works. In Stanford, we have gathered a large collection of raw data, including structural MRIs, functional MRIs or fMRIs, Diffusion tensor imaging, also known as DTI data, EEGs, and neuropsychological testing. These data sets have been analyzed previously using classical statistical methods and show widespread structural and functional changes that correlate with muscle impairment and sleepiness. 
So in order to design an accurate and robust model for DM classification, we have to deal with several challenges. The first challenge is disease widespread effects. Um, in myotonic dystrophy, uh, wide matter effects are found throughout the whole brain, hence providing clinically meaningful measures of the disease requires extracting global features rather than region-based local ones. So we cannot identify a region of interest. We need to analyze the whole brain. The second challenge that we have is a limited data set size. In the general population, about one in 7,000 or 8,000 people from all over the world has myotonic dystrophy. Hence, the size of the DM data set is limited. The third challenge is multi-class imbalance data. The DM data distribution is highly skewed because we have representatives of the control class that they appear much more frequently. But the minority class, which is myotonic dystrophy, is more important from a diagnostic perspective. So in our work, in order to deal with these challenges, we apply um, a novel system based on artificial intelligence to our data set in order to accurately distinguish myotonic dystrophy from controls by studying brain-wide matter lesions via neuroimaging techniques. Um, this is the system that we developed in Stanford. Um, so this is our training data. We perform several pre-processing tasks, including discarding noisy volumes, a slice timing correction, motion correction, and um, data normalization. And then we apply our developed system to the training data, and the output is our model. So this model is able to classify myotonic dystrophy versus controls. One important challenge that we have in dealing with functional MRI data is how to consider both 3D spatial and time dimension information simultaneously. Uh, now, let's see our developed system and the way that uh, we addressed the previous challenge of fMRI. So this slide is good for people who are enthusiastic about artificial intelligence and particularly machine learning. So as you see here, the DM classification system uh, begins with using 3D spatial convolutional neural networks, also called CNNs, to scale 3D spatial features. And then we apply feature pooling and long-term short memory, which is called also LSTM, um, respectively to do feature fusion in time uh, dimension. This method um, can find new features for quantifying normal and uh, pathological variation that we have in the brain. Also, unlike the traditional methods, this method is not limited by some a priori knowledge. We don't have to identify region of interest. We can analyze the whole brain and um, um, consequently, it will result in extracting features that are associated with the whole brain, not with a particular region in the brain. So these are some of the results that we got so far. Here are um, some of the original fMRI scans that we selected randomly from our data set. As we see, each label shows um, the actual class followed by the class predicted by um, our developed system. For example, for this image, the actual class is myotonic dystrophy. And our system also generated myotonic dystrophy for the label. But for this image, the actual label is control, but our system um, generated myotonic dystrophy for the label. So in order to assess the performance of our system, we, we use um, five different measures um, called total accuracy, the specificity of myotonic dystrophy and control, and sensitivity of myotonic dystrophy and control. 
So accuracy is calculated as total number of correct predictions over the total number of predictions that we have. So in our case, it would be the total number of samples that correctly identified as DM or control um, over the total number of samples that we have in our training data. The specificity is calculated as the number of actual negatives which got predicted as a negative over the total number of negatives. For example, when we want to calculate the specificity of BM, the negative class would be control. And then we have sensitivity, which is um, the number of actual positives which got predicted as a positive over the total number of positives. Again, if you want to calculate sensitivity of BM, the positive class would be DM. So these are some of the results that we got um, so far. The specificity of DM is about 72%. The specificity of control is 75%. The sensitivity of BM is 70%. The sensitivity of control is 77%. And the total accuracy is um, 73%. So as we see the results show that the mean um, classification accuracy is quite promising and um, it indicates the possibility of using functional MRI to diagnose myotonic dystrophy. And also um, the obtained specificities and sensitivities show that um, this system has a good ability to correctly reject healthy patients without condition and also correctly detect ill patients who have the condition. So to the best of our knowledge, this work is the first application of artificial intelligence for characterizing myotonic dystrophy using neuroimaging. Um, our strategy allows for the detection of complex relationships between multiple variables, and um, the goal of our work is um, to define brain biomarkers that possibly can be used to measure severity, predict progression, and um, even we can use them to identify DM patients from MRI scans. And um, we're also optimistic that um, the defined brain biomarkers will be used in clinical trials to measure treatment efficacy, through imaging, electrophysiology, and uh, neuropsychological assessments. So thanks everyone for your attention. Um, that's all I wanted to say for today. Uh, great, thanks so much uh, to Hera for uh, sharing that. I think it's really very exciting. I think you know what that's allowing us to do is to come up with a novel way of defining really what the essence of myotonic dystrophy is on these different measures, you know, whether that's MRI or neuropsychological measures or EEG. And that we think is going to be critical when we come into the treatment era. I think we've already heard a few words uh, from uh, Dr. Sampson about treatment of the sleepiness uh, side of myotonic dystrophy. And we've heard uh, some words uh, from uh, Dr. Deutsch about how to best treat or manage uh, some of the neuropsychological challenges. But I did want to just uh, give an allusion to or reference to uh, you know, where we think we're going with regard to treatment. And really the best model we have for that is, is the, still the skeletal muscle, but we think the same lessons apply. So just to reiterate, going back to the beginning, that in myotonic dystrophy, you have these clumps. This is work that Thurman Wheeler and did in Charles Thornton's lab several years ago, showing these clumps again of RNA in the nuclei of the cells that leads then in the muscle to having a loss of protein. So these red rings around the muscle are a particular protein, in this case, chloride channel. And here on the right, you can see the normal distribution in muscle as opposed to in the mouse model of myotonic dystrophy, there's a great loss of that uh, particular protein. And what that leads to then is the presence of the myotonia. So there's the myotonia. It's all due to that, the treatment, 
with an antisense oligonucleotide gets rid of those red clumps, frees up that protein that was sequestered in those clumps, and that leads to a restoration of the chloride channel, which leads to an elimination of the myotonia. So again, this is the best example, I think, of what, how we hope this is going to work. And we're very excited to move this, this technology into the treatment of the central nervous system of myotonic dystrophy and think that it go is going to have some effects uh, far upstream in terms of the cause of all of those myriad symptoms that can be present in myotonic dystrophy. So I, that was the last word I wanted to say in terms of uh, treatment futures. And maybe we can pass it back to Leah if there are any questions. Great, thank you so much to all our presenters. Thank you, John. We do have a few questions that have come in. I know we're um, getting up to the hour, so I'm gonna ask the presenters to unmute yourself, please. And um, the first question is regarding, given the variation of cognitive impacts on DM1 adults, is there a correlation with CTG repeats, lifestyle factors, gender, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, uh, there's a somewhat nebulous answer so that there, there are rough correlations with CTG repeat expansion so that the very big expansions definitely are associated with more changes. The very, very tiny expansions are associated with fewer, but there's a lot of variability and noise in between. So it's by no means a very tight correlation. Certainly lifestyle uh, plays a role here. And then we get into the complexities because you know myotonic dystrophy and all of its effects can affect your lifestyle and then that can affect your behavior. And this, this is a back and forth kind of reiterative process that alters uh, you know, behavior and cognition in various and sundry ways. So I think it, it is a very complex picture. That's why we're interested ultimately in going as far upstream as we can to treat this. Otherwise, we could be playing a huge game of whack-a-mole that I think is oftentimes what we are doing in clinic. But um, well, we'll try to keep, keep these answers succinct. I know every one of the panelists would have another comment to make on that, but if you have other questions, maybe we could try to get through a few more. Sure. Um... One, one other question is, do you use MRIs from studies like Dr. Nick Johnson's in Utah slash Virginia, and how are these analyzed? So, I, I mean, I'm happy to take that, Jacinda, if you want to, you can as well. Um, you know, so I, we absolutely work with, with Dr. Johnson, and we work with the team in Iowa, and we compare notes and do things uh, very similarly. And so, you know, I think that uh, in, in terms of the artificial intelligence approach to this, uh, that oftentimes we want to start with one set and then we can retest and retest and retest on other sets. And so uh, that, that might very well be something that we would do in the future. Exactly. And I, I know Dr. Johnson's group has um, an excellent team working on that analysis and Missy Dixon who is a neuropsychologist, as well as doing some analysis, especially on the pediatric population. So uh, she would be a great person to invite to talk about her work as well. As, as would uh, Dr. Nopolis and Gutman in Iowa, and there are groups in Germany that we work with, as well as in Italy and you know, really around the world. So we definitely try to stay in touch with all of the other groups that are interested in this approach. Great, thank you. Um, one question came in for Dr. Deutsch. Uh, she had talked about visual spatial issues in DM1. The, do, the uh, attendee asked if this if that's also apparent in DM2. It go. can be, but it's not as pronounced in DM2. But I have seen patients where that does show up, as well as some mild executive functioning problems. Thank you. If you have other questions, please send, submit them through the chat box. Um, we have another one that came in. It's not quite related to the topic, but if you're able to answer, is it safe? Is it a safe idea to donate blood as a person with DM? Dr. Sampson? 
Oh, you're throwing that to me. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't think that there's any contraindication to donating blood uh, with myotonic dystrophy, but there are certain medications that if you're taking, they might not want to have you be a blood donor. Um, uh, we don't think of myotonic dystrophy as an infectious disease or something that you could um, give to someone else because it has a genetic basis. Um, but you might have other underlying health issues that your primary care physician might advise you not to be giving blood for some particular reason. So check with your primary care doctor or your myotonic doctor to see if there's any other factors that would make you not ideal as a blood donor. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, one last question, looks like. Um, somebody's writing from Portugal who's asking if their son who has DM2, uh, excuse me, DM1, uh, diagnosed at age 18, he suffers from sleep apnea and uh, bradycardia, and she's seeing a lot of the symptoms that you described in the webinar today as he's getting older. So what strategies do you suggest um, to use to help him as this, uh, his symptoms seem to be progressing in his day-to-day -day activities? Go ahead. So um, absolutely, he should see a sleep specialist if he has sleep apnea, because non-invasive ventilation can be very helpful in supporting your breathing and helping you get better restorative sleep. We also know that there is a brain-heart connection, that the stress of having repeated sleep apnea is not great for your heart rhythm and for your stress hormone levels and things of that nature. But if he has bradycardia, he should also be seeing a cardiologist to know whether or not something such as a pacemaker or a pacer defibrillator would be important, you know, not necessarily instead of, but in parallel with treating the sleep apnea. So those are both important features. They both should be treated in parallel. Treating one or the other isn't going to fix the other problem independently. So both need to be addressed. Thank you so much. We have a few more that come in if you have a few more minutes. Um, are there any treatments for brain fog, processing speed, executive functioning issues at this time? I mean, I think the treatments largely uh, are along the lines of what was uh, mentioned, uh, you know, by both Dr. Sampson and Dr. Deutsch. I think that that you know we don't have any uh, definitive uh, treatments uh, to to correct the deficits at the genetic level. Uh, but uh, there are some definite management approaches that are very, very useful and valuable to help uh, organize your sleep better, to make sure that you're getting the amount of sleep you need, and then also to make sure that you're more alert and awake during the day. So I think both sides of that are important and they can contribute. And then I think the management issues that Dr. Deutsch um, mentioned about, you know, how do you kind of uh, learn to structure your, your life and, and uh, daily activities uh, so that some of these challenges are really reduced and their impact is, is also very important. Okay, great. Um, and when a question came in around um, child, uh, juvenile onset adults, can you talk more about the cognitive changes that are apparent with that population's specifically lack of maturity, non-compliance? It's a Gail question. There. So yes, um, there are can be a lot of um, issues in children that I didn't really have a chance to discuss. Um, I'm not sure if the um, person asking the question is also concerned about social issues but um, it really helps um, right from the get-go to really um, have this person or this child assessed. You know, I'm not trying to say everyone needs a neuropsychological assessment, but it can be really important to have this in conjunction with some academic testing because we will look at mood, emotion, and something called adaptive abilities, and that's what it sounds like this parent may be noticing. So even if someone has um, general cognitive ability and it's at the normal range, someone can still have a hard time 
being able to put things all together and actually do their household chores or do the things they need to do to get out of the house in the morning. And it may not just be a developmental issue. It may be just part of um, having DM. And so different kinds of therapies can be helpful, family therapy, trying to teach the child some independence. It's really kind of a team approach when you have a child because you need um, help at home as a parent. Parenting classes can help. Also, school accommodations can help. So you really need to kind of tackle it from a lot of different areas. But if someone wants to email me, that would be fine too. I'd be happy. Not that I can um, give very specific recommendations, but I can talk a little bit more about what I think might be helpful. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was on mute for a second. Um, and can you speak to about any medications that you can re recommend for interrupted sleep? Dr. Sampson, do you want to field that? Oh, sorry. So um, interrupted sleep, most often if you can address the underlying sleep apnea is the primary way that we address that is less than medication and more uh, treating the respiratory causes of interrupted sleep is, is the uh, first and I think most important approach. Thanks. And do you have any clinical trials coming up that you can talk to the attendees about in any of these areas? So uh, we uh, recently completed, uh, uh, participated in a clinical trial, uh, you know, looking at ways to improve uh, alertness. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to really uh, studying the results of that and, and uh, letting people uh, kind of giving, giving results from that trial as soon as we can. Uh, uh, so we're not recruiting it to that trial anymore, but we are uh, very much looking forward to some upcoming trials uh, that uh, we hope, you know, will be launched within, you know, one to two years, something on that time frame. Uh, but we will definitely keep people aware. Now, I think it's important that uh, the community is aware of the importance of doing uh, the necessary work prior to those trials being launched, because uh, we do have a lot of work to do to get our outcome measures and biomarkers and natural history and kind of study design issues worked out. And so we do have a number of trials going on now uh, that are trying to answer those issues. So please uh, feel free to contact us. I know some other centers around the country and around the world are doing similar studies. We're doing some of them in, in networks. We're doing some of them at individual sites. So there's no no limit to the number of things that you could help with, and we can't do it without you. So thanks for asking, and please uh, you know, reach out and get involved. And I was also going to give a shout out that we're recruiting now for observational clinical trials, particularly uh, looking at spinal fluid studies. So if, if you might be willing to have a lumbar puncture or spinal tap, uh, we would love to talk to you about that particular study so we can learn from the spinal fluid to correlate to things like brain scans, cognition, EEG findings and such, um, but also these natural history studies that give us the information to help us design the clinical trials are really important. Great, thank you both so much and thanks to all of our presenters and for sticking with us a little few minutes after the hour. Um, we will send this presentation out as a recording, so feel free to check your email this afternoon. And thanks again for everybody's time, for tuning in, and to our great presenters today for this very important topic. And have a great rest of your Friday. You too. Thanks a lot. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you.